my question is, can I teach the class to do origami? I got into origami because I've always been creative with projects and have always been in love with making them. But before we can make origami, we have to learn about the history. The Japanese word origami itself is a compound of two smaller Japanese words, ori, root, root word ori, meaning to fold, and kami meaning paper. Until recently, not all forms of paper or folding were grouped under the word origami. Before that, paper folding for play was known by a variety of names including Arkita, Orisu, Oramano, Chachamagami, and others. Exactly why origami became the common name is not known. It has been suggested that the word adopted in the kindergarten because written characters were easier for young children to write. Another theory is that the word origami was a direct translation of the German word paper fountain, brought into Japan with the kindergarten movement around 1880. Japanese origami began sometime after Buddhist monks in the 6th century carried paper to Japan. The first Japanese origami is dated from the 6th century and was used for ceremonial pieces only, due to the high price of paper. In 1845, Adachi Kazuyuki published a more comprehensive compilation of paper folding with Hayakuruzu by the late 1800s term for paper folding and had begun to origami. Now that we know about the history, it's time to make origami. I'm going to play a video showing you how to do origami pelican. because I've always been, it's always been a weird thing that I like to mess around with wires and batteries and just random things. And I decided that this would be a really cool thing because I actually saw a video on how they make these in the factories. And I thought, you know, I could probably make that a lot easier and make it at home. And I did do that. So this is basically the things that they sell that kind of with, like it can make all different kinds of things. This is the kind of stuff that they, use for kits that you can buy, but those are not the ones that I used. Okay, so I think we're going to try it out now. So before we try it out, I'm going to show you how it works. So basically there's a Velcro side on here, and there's a small patch in here, and everything that's electrical or wires is covered up inside this, and this is Velcro. And it has a, seat, uh, a hand warmer in it, which is basically it causes whenever the batteries get heated, they start to heat up. And it causes the seat to get warm. Before they start to heat themselves up. And that's the reason, because at first, we didn't um, have anything in there and we just tried it out and we shook the batteries and tried to create like friction and stuff to make it hot and it was not getting hot at all, nothing. So we decided that we needed a different heat source so we decided that uh, with a lot of brainstorming with these which you can get at Academy <coughs> or Army Navy store which they're um, 24 hour hand warmers, which actually sounds pretty weird, but it works. So this is actually not flammable at all. So it was good for that. And at first, we were gonna try the just normal fiber fill, but we're thinking that could be that could catch on fire. Like that's not a good thing. So we decided to use polyfill instead. I hope you enjoyed my passion project. Thank you. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Riley, and my driving question is, what are the unique characteristics of the red panda? This interested me because um, I saw a picture of them online, and they were so adorable, and I wanted to learn more. Where it lives. The red panda is a mammal native to the eastern Himalayas and southwestern China. They're, they sleep in the trees in daytime, and their habitat is being threatened by people cutting down trees for farmland. Um, what it eats? The red panda feeds mainly on bamboo, but also eats small animals, birds, eggs, flowers, mushrooms, roots, acorns, lichens, and berries. Their diet consists of around two-thirds bamboo, and occasionally they supplement their diets with fish and insects. Red pandas also like fake sugar. People discovered that red pandas like three different types of sugar. They're, they are neotame, sucralose, which is slenda, aspir and aspartame, which is equal. Red pandas, despite their name, are not closely related to pandas. In fact, they have more in common with skunks, raccoons, and weasels. Um, their characteristics. The red panda has reddish brown fur, shaggy tail, and a waddling gait due to its shorter front legs. The red panda's reddish brown color acts like camouflage, camouflage in the canopy of fir trees where branches are covered with white clumps of lichens. Um, no, but, uh, covered with clumps of reddish brown moss and white lichens. They are roughly the size of a domestic cat, but with a longer body and somewhat heavier. Their weight is around 12 to 20 pounds. The head and body length of a red panda measures 20 to 25 inches, and its tail is an additional 11 to 23 inches. Males weigh 8.2, which is 13.7 pounds. Their average lifespan is 8 to 12 years in the wild, and they were discovered about 50 years before the giant panda. The red panda is classified endangered because of its wild population is being estimated at less than 10,000 mature animals and continues to, to decline. I'll show you a video to show you. I'm Dominique, and today I'm at the Auckland Zoo to meet up with Bianca, who takes care of one of the cutest animals in the zoo. So Dominique, you're the first one that is not a keeper that is going to come visit these lovely two additions and mum up the tree, so hopefully they'll come down. Um, they haven't really seen people not in uniform, so hopefully they'll come grab some grapes off you. What type of pandas are these? So these lovely red pandas are Nepalese red pandas, so found mainly in the foothills of the Himalayas. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> Uh, so these two guys are quite new to, they don't have the right manners yet, so we'll just let him, there we go, have it. So cute. Hi, my name is Caleb and today I'll be teaching you about the United States Marine Corps. My driving question is, can I teach the class about the Marines? The Marines were formed on November 10, 1775 by Samuel Nicholas. Formed to conduct ship-to-ship -ship fighting, shipboard security, discipline, and assist in landing forces. Boot camp. This is the most grueling boot camp in the military. Three phases in 13 weeks, the longest period of training in the military. Phase one, week one through four. This is the phase where a citizen becomes a Marine. This is where recruits do the confidence course and PT. PT is physical training. Phase two, week five through nine, this is where recruits start weapons and field training. Marines do this to develop efficiency with their weapon and fellow Marines. That Then they are put in the gas chamber. The gas chamber is like something that they put in there and then they have this guy in the center that puts in some kind of chemicals and it turns into gas and they have gas masks on and stuff. Phase three, week 10 through 13, this is where they take swim qualifications, the defensive driving course, first aid, PT, another PT, inspections, and then graduation. Here's a short video on the speech at Paris Island. My name is Councilor Salcedo, and I'm your senior drill sergeant. I'm assistant in my duty by drill instructor, Staff Sergeant Dixon. And drill instructor, Staff Sergeant the house. Our mission is to train equal to do to become the United States Marine. The Marines have a bunch of weapons, but it would take me all day to list them all, but I'll name a few. 
First off, the M16A4, or the, just the M16. Then there's the M4, which is a smaller, lighter, more compact version of the M16. Next, there's the M24OV, which is an LMG or light machine gun, which is this right here. And then we have the Barrett 50 caliber, which is a sniper rifle. It's got mad kick on it. Relics. The U.S. Marines have been collecting stuff over the years. There's a lot of stuff traced back to the Civil War, but most of the items were collected during World War II. Walls are barriers. They divide, separate, segregate. We've seen walls before. almost twice as long as a year on Mars, as a year on Earth. One day on Mars is 24 hours and 37 minutes, almost the same as an Earth day. The temperature on Mars is ranged from negative 125 degrees to 23 degrees. In addition, gravitational tugging by planets constantly change the shape of their orbits a little bit. In 1659, Christina Huygens was the first to discover Mars. Mars has polar ice caps and is the only planet to have them. Is Mars red hot? Mars may look hot, but don't let its color fool you. Mars is actually pretty cold. In orbit, Mars is about 50 million miles farther away from the sun than Earth. That means it gets a lot less light and heat to keep it warm. Mars also has a hard time holding onto the heat it does get. On Earth, much of the sun's heat gets trapped in our atmosphere, which acts like a blanket to keep our planet warm. But Mars's atmosphere is about a hundred times thinner than Earth's, so heat from the sun can easily escape. How easily? If you were standing on the Martian equator at noon, it would feel like summer at your feet, but winter near your head. At night, it's even worse. When the sun goes down, the temperatures can plummet to negative triple digits. And beware of cold winter nights when it could drop even lower. So if you plan to visit, better bring a spacesuit to keep warm. Mars really is a pretty cool planet. Hi, my name is Sarah, and my driving question is, can I teach the class about Colorado? I picked this topic because my cousin was born there and because one of my friends from my old school used to live there and always told me about it. Things to do in Colorado. In Colorado, you can go hiking up mountains, hang gliding through canyons and waterfalls, and rock climbing. Colorado Springs is a place to do activities. It is located at the eastern foot of the Rocky Mountains. There is lots of things to do in Colorado, especially if you're adventurous. Fun facts about Colorado. The state capital of Colorado is Denver. Colorado is the only state in history to turn down the Olympics but then accepted them later. The world's largest flat top mountain, the Grand Mesa, is in Colorado. Colorado makes up 75% of the land mass in the U.S. The state bird is the lark bunting. The population of Colorado is 5,029,196. There are lots of cool facts about Colorado. Colorado landmarks. One of the most popular landmarks in Colorado is the Grand Mesa. Also Pikes Peak, which is a mountain where you can go hiking and rock climbing and lots of other things. There is also a Rocky Mountain National Park. There is an amazing place in Colorado called the Garden of Gods. It is a place you can go see sandstone formations and go hiking on trails. 
Colorado's history. On August 1st, 1876, Colorado was admitted as a state. It is the eighth largest state in land mass. It was first discovered in the 1500s by the Europeans. In 1858, the discovery of gold brought new settlers. Here's a video about Colorado's <coughs> Tucked into the breathtaking front range of the Colorado Rockies, Colorado Springs is the natural fit for family vacations. Romantic getaways, meetings, tours, weddings, reunions, events, and competitions. Our sunny, mild climate and spectacular Rocky Mountain scenery Invite visitors year-round to explore the beauty of this unique region where the plains meet the mountains in panoramic places like Pikes Peak, Garden of the Gods, Palmer Park, Red Rock Canyon, and Paint Mines Interpretive Park. Hi, my name is Sasha. I'm doing my passion project on the Trans Alaskan Pipeline. It interested me because my grandpa's friend uh, welded on the Alaskan Pipeline. The Alaskan Pipeline was envisioned as a major component towards the goal of making America more energy independent. Our leaders realized that energy independent was directly related to our national defense. Without our own oil and gas, we would be reliant on others for our own energy. Some of these countries might actually be against us. Some important facts about the pipeline. It costs $7 billion, it's 800 miles long, and 127,000 people worked on the project from start up to the finish. 20,000 workers were working at any given time. The occupations of the workforce included cooks, dishwashers, maids, doctors, nurses, truck drivers, equipment operators, pilots, both airplanes and helicopters, welders, and their helpers. The environmental concerns were very deeply held. The most stringent requirement ever placed on any construction project were placed on the pipeline. Every weld had to be 100 degrees x-ray. The builders were constantly monitored by both state and federal authorities. The main concerns were the pre priesthood landscape of the wildlife migration route. The pipeline was divided into section with each section having its own camp town. The camps had names like Crazy Horse, Happy Valley, Cold Foot, Prospect, and The Old Man. They were developed along the enti entire length of the pipeline route. The camps provided TV libraries, pool halls, ping pong, shuffleboard movies, and live concerts for the workers in North America. The camps also provided the workers with the finest dining faculties possible. Chefs from the best restaurants around the world were hired. No expenses were denied. A typical week at at a camp saw the workers consume 480 gallons of milk, 800 pounds of steak, 300 pounds of ribs, 300 pounds of lobster tail, 60 gallons of ice cream, 210 pies, 455 dozen eggs, 1,000 pounds of hamburger. Because of the harsh weather conditions, both food and liquid consumption was very critical. Workers had to make sure they consumed enough calories to burn during a day's work. Likewise, they were encouraged to double their intake of fluids to stay hydrated. The pipeline was placed on above ground supports. This allowed for the migration of the large caribou, elk, moose, and deer. In the harsh weather condition, the pipeline and its service roads have been proven beneficial to the migration of these animals. That is a a replica that my friend who welded on this pipeline built. Uh, he was down at Valdez and he saw this ship sitting there. This ship was sitting 
at the dock empty, and Gary took a picture of it. He went back, and in his spare time, he built this ship. Everything on this ship is identical to the ship that was sitting at that dock from these front supports. These are uh, fog horns. All this piping is just like it was on the ship. It, it's a, just a miniature of that ship, and it was. It shows the talent of that friend of mine. It's where the tundra was frozen, and when it went into the ground here, they insulated the pipe so that the heat off of this pipe wouldn't melt that tundra because if it melted, it turned like oatmeal. Then if the deer and caribou and all those animals walked across that, they would sink down and die. Mm. So they required them to insulate this pipeline where it went underground to, to uh, protect the permafrost. Hey, my name is London and I'm on DG about the giant pandas and unique characteristics of them. Or to go to save the panda, go to WWF Worldwide Fund for Nature to donate bamboo or you can sign up. What pandas do to help the environment? <clears throat> we should do everything we can to save the giant panda because we are the ones that have driven them to the edge of extinction. And because, and because we can. But panda, but pandas, but pandas, so by saving panda, we will also be saving so much more. We will be, be helping to protect not only these unique forest, unique forest, but also the wealth of species that live in them, such as a dwarf blue sheep and beautiful, and beautiful multicolored bison. But pandas also play a crucial role in China's bamboo forest by spreading seeds and helping the vegetation to grow. To find, to find more information, go to WWF, Why Should We Save the Panda? Jackin is actually a bear. There are about 2,000 pandas left in the wild. All pandas in the world are woven from John. Pandas can poop up to 40 times a day. Hi, my name is Bailey and I'm doing my passion project on swag trunks and my driving question was can I teach the class about swag trunks and what are they? This impacts me to teach y'all about one because I have one, so let's get started. What are the similarities between a swag trun and a hoverboard? They all use the same gyroscopic technology to steer to move forwards and backwards using your body weight. They are very easy to operate, difficult for some people. They both have bumpers on the sides to prevent scratches and damages to the outer body. They are all two solid, constructed, and durable, made with high quality components. What are the differences between a hoverboard and a swag trun? The hoverboards do not go off road because of the tire size, and it is not as high lifted as the swag trun. The original hoverboards don't have Bluetooth speakers, but the hoverboards that started coming out later on started having more high quality things. Here are some different types of designs you can get in them, and you can customize your own. There also are different types of colors like desert camo, pink camo, black, and any regular color such as the rainbow. The cost of swag trons. The cost of swag trons are normally about $400 to $300, and they can get up to $600. It depends on what type of model they are and if they're newer or what kind of new features they have. What all they can do. They can go off road. The T3, T6, and T5 have an app called Swag Tron that shows you the speed you're going in a Bluetooth so you can play music on your Swag Tron. They can tell you what kind of Swag Trons you have and what type of damage you have done to the inner body. The different types of Swag Trons. The T1 Swag Tron weighs 5 pounds and the tire size is 6.5. It does not have Bluetooth speakers and does not have the iPhone app and it cannot go off road. The T3 Swagtron weighs 5 pounds and its tire size is 6.5 and, and it does, does have Bluetooth speakers and has the iPhone app, it, has not, it cannot go off road. Swagtron T5 it weighs 6 pounds and has the Bluetooth speakers and does have the iPhone app and it does not go off road. The Swagtron T6 is what I have, its tire size is 10 and weighs 8 pounds and has the Bluetooth speakers and can go off road.
My name is Carly and obviously my topic is twirling. I wanted to do this topic because I want to be a twirler. Plus, I wanted to know a little bit about it. So please enjoy my presentation. The origin of twirl is unknown, but some people think it started in Eastern Europe and some dance festivals, but there is no exact year, month, or date. Fun fact number one. Um, some people are very gifted to twirl. Your wrists have to be in very good shape, but if you hurt your wrist in your life and you are a twirler, you could be doomed because you couldn't twirl for the rest of your life. Fun fact number two. There's a reason for the tips of the baton. When it has to be heavier to where when you twirl it, it rotates. Fun fact number three. When you buy your baton at the store, it needs to be from the beginning of your arm to your fingertips. If it is too long, then you probably won't be able to twirl with it. A couple of twirling tricks. There's little joke flips, palm spins, lasso straddles, thumb tosses, neck rolls, double leg rolls, uh, elbow arm rolls, and leg to legs. Now, some tricks I will be showing you. September 8, 1954, was six when she became the first African American child to integrate a white Southern elementary school on November 14, 1960. She was escorted to class by her mother and U.S. Marshals due to violent laws. There were large crowds of people outside of the school every day. They were throwing things and shouting at Ruby. As soon as Bridges entered the school, white parents pulled their own children out. All the teachers refused to teach while a black child was enrolled. Only one person agreed to teach Ruby, and that was Barbara, Hen Barbara Henry from Boston, Massachusetts. And for over a year, Henry taught her alone, as if she was teaching a whole class. Every morning, as Bridges walked to school, one woman would threaten to poison her. Because of this, the U.S. Marshals dispatched by President Eisenhower, who overseen her safety, allowed Ruby to only eat the food that she brought them. The Bridges family suffered from their decision to send her to the school, but they continued. Her father lost his job. The grocery store the family shopped at would no longer let them sh shop there, and her grandparents, who were sharecroppers in Mississippi, lost their land. A neighbor provided her father with a new job, and local people babysit, watched the house as protectors, and walked behind the federal marshal's car on the trip to school. If it hadn't been for you guys, I might not be here, and we wouldn't be looking at this together. So. Just having him say that meant a lot to me, and um, it always has. But to be standing shoulder to shoulder with history and viewing history is just once in a lifetime. The painting depicts my walk into um, William Bryant School integrating the public school systems in 1960. I'm doing the history of Japanese martial arts. How it came to be. It goes all the way back to the medieval times when martial arts in Japan was born. It was created during a period of war for the Japanese. The samurai, the warriors of Japan, were the people who knew this art. Most of the martial arts made it, was made in China. The Japanese modified their art to their own. They used weapons like bow staffs, empty-handed techniques, archery, and sword fight. The attacks and movements of the art contain straight line attacks, wide stances, wide ranged attacks, katas, and also weapons, much different from China's more circular movements. The five styles in Japanese martial arts are karate, aikido, jiu-jitsu, and ju judo, and also kendo. The meaning of the word karate. The word karate came from the Okinawa, the, an island in Japan. Karate means empty hand because the Okinawa people fought empty handed, meaning they used no weapons, discipline, and mortality. 
Bushido is known as the way of the warrior and is the basic code of conduct from Japanese society. And now, just for fun, here's my yellow belt pictures from Karate. Thank you to Miss LeBou for mailing these pictures for me. Thank you for watching. teaching you all about Maltese. The reason this interested me was because I have a Maltese of my own and her name is Belle. Maltese. A dog breed who is gentle and fearless. The Maltese greets everyone as a friend. His glamorous white coat gives him a look of haughty nobility, but looks can be deceiving. This is a sprightly, vigorous dog who excels not only as a companion, but also as a therapy dog and competitor in such dog sports as agility, obedience, rally, and tracking. But most of all, he loves to be with his people. The history. The Maltese dog is one of the most ancient of the toy breeds with a history that can be traced back at least two millennia. Artists, poets, and writers immortalized this small dog in the early great cultures of Greece, Rome, and Egypt. They even were mentioned by Aristotle. The Greeks erected tomes for their Maltese dogs, while representations of Maltese-like dogs on Egyptian artifacts suggest that they were prized by that ancient culture. The Egyptians and centuries later Many Europeans thought that the Maltese had the ability to cure disease and they would place one on the pillow of an ill person. This inspired one of its names, the Comforter. Even before the Christian era, the breed was widespread in Mediterranean cultures. Despite the prominence in history, the exact origin of the Maltese dog is uncertain. Many believe the breed was developed in the Isle of Malta in the Mediterranean Sea from Spitz or Spaniel type dogs. Others believe he was developed in Italy and still others believe that he was originally from Asia and had part in developing many of the smaller Asian dogs. Wherever he came from, the Maltese thrived. By the 15th century, he had found a secure place in the arms and heart of French aristocrats. During the reign of Henry, Maltese arrived in the British Isles. By the end of the 16th century, the Maltese had a favorite pet for noble and royal ladies. The little dog was a favorite of Queen Elizabeth I, Mary, Queen of Scots, and Queen Victoria. Numerous painters, including Goya and Sir Joshua Reynolds included these small dogs in their portraits of beautiful women. Although he survived the fall of Roman Empire and the Dark Ages, the Maltese was nearly destroyed in the 17th and 18th century when attempts were made to bring him to the, be the size of a squirrel. After this nearly disastrous experiment, breeders mixed poodles, miniature spaniels, and East Asian miniature dogs with the breed to save it. This resulted in Maltese becoming so varied that several new breeds were formed. It is thought that by many that Maltese are direct ancestors of the Bichon Fries, Balognese, and Havanese breeds. English breeders developed the Maltese as we know them now. Many of the Maltese in the U.S. trace their heritage back to English imports. Maltese are one of the most popular breeds among spectators at dog shows and frequently win the toy group. They also have an excellent record in the best show competition. Size. The compact Maltese should weigh no more than 7 pounds at maturity, with 4 to 6 pounds being preferred. Males should be 8 to 10 inches tall at the shoulder, while females should be 8 to 9 inches tall. Beware of breeders who offer teacup Maltese. A Maltese that weighs less than 4 pounds at maturity is more prone to genetic disorders and is at a higher health risk. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Hi, my name is Corbin, and my driving question is how did Coach Bryce become one of the best basketball players ever? This interested me because uh, he was a great competitor in the NBA, and he was a great scorer. Kobe Bean Bryant was born August 23, 1978. He's an American professional basketball player and businessman. He played his entire career with the Los Angeles Lakers. He entered the NBA directly from high school and won five NBA championships with the Lakers. Bryant is an 18-time All-Star, 15-time member of the All-NBA team, and 12-time member of the all nba he led the NBA in scoring during two seasons and ranks third on the league all-time regular season score and fourth on the all-time postseason scoring list. On January 22, 2006, Kobe Bryant scored 81 points and only 19 points behind Wilt Chamberlain, who scored 100 points on March 2, 1962. His dad was an NBA player as well. Uh, Kobe Bryant enjoyed a su successful high school basketball career at Lower Marion High School in Pennsylvania where he was recognized as a top high school player in the country. He was
was selected 13th overall in the 1996 NBA draft by the Charlotte Hornets, who traded him to the Lakers. As a rookie, he was a favorite with the Lakers fans. Bryant won the 1997 slam dunk contest, and he was named an all-star by his second season. Even though Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal didn't always get along, they successfully led the Lakers to three consecutive NBA championships from 2000 and 2002. Interesting facts. His parents named him after a type of steak. The beef is from a species of cattle raised in the Kobe region of Japan. Kobe Bryant won an Oscar award on March 4, 2018. Kobe Bryant was the first guard ever directly drafted directly out of high school. Kobe Bryant had a total of 2,883 points when he got down with high school. He had a total of 32,643 points when he retired from the NBA. He holds the NBA record for the most seasons played with one franchise for an entire career. And Kobe with emphasis. On test looking, gets it to Bryant. Bryant Turner has to put it up for the buzzer. Banks it in! He banks in the three! And the Lakers win the game! And that is just greatness personified. <laughs> What is the history of slime and can I teach the class how to make non-toxic slime? The reason why this interests in me is because since I was five years old, I used to play with slime a lot. And I've been wanting to make it on my own with like a lot of different materials. The quality of the slime is number one, fluffy slime. Fluffy slime acts just like glue in quicksand and fluid. Number two, the motion gives the slime its slimy, slippery feel. Number three, most slime melts in cold air. Number four, some slimes are very liquidy, and number five, some slimes are very fluffy. The history of slime. During my research, I was so surprised to learn that slime actually dates back to the 20th century, when the science of cyanithic polymers was being discovered during the 1920s. Herman Stagyar helped others understand the basics of polymer science. His models were checked by Mayer and Mark. These two scientists studied the dimensions of natural rubber using x-ray techniques. By the 1930s, Staguar models are accepted by most people and extensive development began. Many factories have sold polymer clay materials like slime for years, not only for fun, but for helping with hand coordination and creativity. The earliest of these toys were and moldable materials like molding clay. The need for better clay materials led to the development of silly putty in the 1950s. Well in the dark silly putty was introduced afterwards. During the 1980s, various slime type toys were introduced. These products were made of made from such materials as pollen, pollen spiny, alcohol, and gear gums, or even portion of milk. Materials needed. To make fluffy slime, you will need Elmer's glue, contact solution, shaving cream, food coloring, any color. And if you want to, you can add added speeds, glitter, paint, or more. Steps for making your non-toxic slime. Number one, first get a bowl. Number two, next something to mix with. Number three, then get all materials. Number four, now pour glue into the bowl. Number five, mix with how much shaving cream you want into the bowl. Number six, then add color, any. Number seven, add contact solution. Eight, add decoration, any, and then number nine, you're done. Thank you for the slime, Emma. Hi, my name is Lainey, and my drawing question is, what is a buckskin horse, and what are they used for? Buckskin horses are well known and universally loved by not only horse people, but non-horse people too. Buckskins are popular because of old western television shows like the Roy Rogers Show, Home on the Prairie, Ride'em Cowboy, Hopalong Cassidy, 
and more. They have special traits because of the bones. Why they are special horses. Buckskins are really friendly and good with kids. They are known for their hard work. It is known for them to have hard to have a hard hoof, so people say they have hooves of steel. That's my three-year-old brother with our buckskin. That's a picture I found on the internet. Buckskins are often in petite size, but yet they are 58.4 inches and 1,275 pounds. Buckskin horses eat grain or hay. Buckskins live up to 25 to 33 years. Some can live no longer than 15 years of age because of heart attacks or cancer. There's a picture of one of our other buckskin horses eating hay. The name comes from their coat. In the movie Spirit, they use a buckskin horse. The horse is a, has a tan or gold colored coat with black points. The black points are the main tail and lower legs. Buckskin occurs as a result of the cream utilization gene acting on a bay horse. Buckskins shouldn't be confused with the dun colored horses, which have the dun utilization gene, not the cream. The buckskins coloring can be found in many different breeds of horses. Although buckskins are not a specific breed, the buckskin is a common color found in horses.